so let's get started. Uh, I'm Charlie Wyman. I think I've met all of you, but uh, I work for Mass Audubon and am the staff person at Mass Audubon working on the uh, effort to protect the Sibley and Warner Farms. Uh, Dana Reed, who just left and will be back in a second, is a member of the Spencer Conservation Commission, which is our partner in this, along with two other organizations, the Greater Worcester Land Trust and the Common Ground Land Trust. Common Ground is a small local land trust here in Spencer and Leicester, and Greater Worcester, of course, covers the Greater Worcester area. And it's those four organizations that are working to try to preserve uh, the Sibley and Warner Farms. I'm Ginny Scarlett, and I want to uh, talk to you about saving Sibley Farm as open space. Um, I'm a resident of Spencer. I'm an advocate for open space. I'm an officer of Common Ground Land Trust. And there's a major project led by Massachusetts Audubon, and uh, other, there are other partners, and I'll tell you who those are, to keep the farm um, open space available to citizens and the public to for recreation and f for it to be able to continue uh, doing the good things it does for everyone in terms of cleaning up water, uh, improving air quality, and so forth. And this is it here. You each have a small map, um, but we are right here at the uh, what was the, the uh, Wendy Warner farm, a homestead and barn. This was a horse farm until six years ago. And what we're going to do today is uh, walk up the road a little bit, walk up along the Mid-State Trail, which comes up through these woods here, uh, climbs the hill, crosses the edge of this field up here and along the edge of the field. Uh, right about here, the Mid-State then turns to the southeast, but we're going to turn north on a farm road that will take us down a hill along the edge of this pond and up to uh, the farm road that runs up alongside the, the uh, hay field and wind up right about there. That's our objective. That's where the cider and, uh, and donuts are. We um, have been uh, with especially Charlie Wyman uh, guiding walks across the property so that people have the opportunity to see it. And people who can't make the walk um, have a chance to see it on the video that, that's coming up. I hope you'll watch. I hope if you can, you'll go out and take a look at the property. We hope to run at least one more walk. And I hope you'll think about, as you, it, as you drive up and down Route 9, um, what Route 9 will look like if those fields that you can see, just past Ahern uh, Equipment Corporation, turn into buildings. And also think about whether we need another set of businesses right there. Let me tell you a little bit about what to expect today. This is not uh, a, uh, a sanctuary, a conservation area that's been managed for public use. This is still owned by the bank. And so uh, the uh, parts of the trail are a little bit rough. You'll need to watch your footing. There is one spot where we need to cross a stream on some uh, rocks, and so that's why I have these along to, to help balance uh, each of us as we cross, because that can be a little slippery. Uh, and the mosquitoes haven't been bad. I have yet to find a tick from all the times I've walked on the property, but of course you want to be careful about that. A little bit about the history of the property, and, and then we'll get started, or at least the recent history. is I think probably most of you know, um, this was all purchased by a developer from sort of 2002 to 2005. Um, they assembled this property, a total of 352 acres, and went through the permitting process and won approval for a total of, um, for a condo development, 304 units off a, a road that would wind from Route 9 down through the property like this, come out here with uh, several spur roads uh, off it. In addition, there was going to be a retail shopping center up here along Route 9 that's zoned commercial, 200,000 square feet of, of retail shopping center. They got uh, fully permitted by about 2006, 2007. I think all of us thought that was going to be the end of the property and it, and it would be developed, but the economy turned down. The developer never got started. Uh, last year, the bank foreclosed and took it back, and it's now owned by DCU, Digital Federal Credit Union. Uh, as soon as they foreclosed, we started talking to them. They wanted to put the property on the market because they thought it was worth more than we thought it was worth. 
Um, this spring, we uh, began discussions again, and that led to the point where in July, we finally uh, signed an option uh, that gives Mass Audubon a year until next June to purchase the property for $2.3 million. And Mass Audubon didn't acquire the option because we have $2.3 million sitting in the bank and, and ready to buy it. What we wanted to do was buy time, buy time to see if a conservation partnership could come together that together could afford to acquire and protect this land um, for watershed protection, for wildlife habitat, and for people to use. You couldn't take it by eminent domain? No. The town could, but eminent domain can be very expensive. Um, you're sort of at the risk that um, the bank uh, or any owner might claim that it's worth far more than the town um, would offer. Uh, and you could wind up in court and it could cost a bundle. It's much safer, more predictable to have a negotiated uh, agreement and, and that's what we have with the bank. So we have until June to sort of assemble this partnership and, and raise the funds and uh, that's what we're trying to do. And the purpose of this walk, and we had one a couple of weeks ago, and we may have one later this fall, is just to give people a chance to come out, see the property, um, see what beautiful land it is, and think about what it would be like to have this land protected and available for the public to use. We're going to walk up along the roadside, so just be careful for the first hundred yards and then we'll turn into the woods. What we have really is what's called an option to purchase. So we have a piece of paper uh, and we've put down a, a small deposit uh, to secure, but we have a piece of paper that says that if Mass Audubon tells the bank by next June that we want to purchase this property for $2.3 million, the bank is obligated to sell it to us. So it's, it locks in what the target is, because um, otherwise we could put in a tremendous amount of effort and if we didn't have an agreement with the bank, you know, um, we weren't sure whether we'd be successful. Um, so this way it sort of locks it in, we know what the target is, and we have until, until June at the latest to, to raise it. It's um, been a valuable asset. It's been used by people for hunting, for um, the Snowbale Trail goes across it, Mid-State Trail goes across that property. And then, uh, in about 2006, um, a developer who owned it got permits from the town to build up to, well, over 300 housing units and on the property and commercial mall type development along the frontage on Route 9. Then that developer, happily for our point of view, went bust and um, bank foreclosed. And now Massachusetts Audubon, one of the partners trying to save it, um, has negotiated an option with the bank to buy the property for conservation purposes at, for the 350 acres that make up the property um, is a bargain price, but it sounds somewhat intimidating. It's $2.3 million. Um, that is expensive. Audubon can't afford it. The town can't aff may not be able to afford it. Um, and there are two other partners working on putting a package together so that together it can be preserved. The other two are Greater Worcester Land Trust and Common Ground Land Trust. Right here, we've just turned onto the Mid-State Trail, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It is a long-distance footpath that runs from Connecticut to New Hampshire. For most of its length, it's on land just by the permission of the landowner, and so it's a constant struggle for the Mid-State Trail Committee when a particular piece of land is developed or a landowner changes his mind or a new landowner says, gee, I don't want the public on my land, to try to figure out how to reroute the trail so that it continues to connect and, uh, and provide that long distance footpath. And one of the purposes and goals of protecting this land is in order to secure it uh, on this part of the trail. So um, yeah, there is an easement on the opposite side of the road that brings the trail up to Greenville Street and then from here, it passes up, it would pass through what hopefully will be protected land onto Mass Audubon's Brinko Pond Wildlife Sanctuary, which is protected, and that leads the way to uh, Polar Spring Road and, and where it crosses Route 9. Hmm.
Is that the sign for the Mid-State Trail right there on the tree? Yes, but uh, it also was marked by these yellow oh. blazes and these little uh, I'm yellow I'm too triangles. fast. You right. first. So I thought I'd just stop for a second. I'm curious about others' experience with this property. Has anyone ever been on either the Warner or Sibley Farms before of any, uh, either hunting or hiking or um, horseback riding, any stories to relate? I remember Sibley Farm when it was an operating uh, farm. Yep, yep. And um, the, the area where the high school is located and the hill in back of it, uh, was uh, pasture land, mm -hmm. and um, I can remember the operation. That's about all. Yeah, and the the sort of main center of the operation is where Ragsdale is. Exactly. Right? Yep. That barn, that uh, that old barn with the Kia sign, is located. That barn was uh, one of the main buildings of the of the farm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I've done a little studying of, of uh, Spencer history and, and particularly the Sibley Farms. Um, Rufus Sibley. Uh, grew up here in Spencer and uh, worked for a couple of years as a school teacher. Then he uh, worked as a store clerk. He went to Boston to pursue um, opportunities there. And then he and a couple of uh, friends went off to Rochester to start their own dry goods retail business. And they were extraordinarily successful. He made a fortune. And one of the things he did uh, was he came back to his hometown of Sibley and um, bought what was then called Moose Hill Farm, which is essentially where the high school is today, uh, and essentially started uh, farming there, probably more as a hobby, but uh, he brought in Jersey cows and became known as a Jersey breeder, uh, won many awards uh, far and wide, and over time bought more and more uh, property uh, until at one point it, it was uh, hundreds, if not maybe a thousand acres, a great yes, deal of land. Um, and. Uh, he passed away, left it to his son, John Sibley, who continued the farm and really tried to make it uh, more of a profitable operation. Um, the dairy, bus uh, dairy business, at one point they were delivering milk mm -hmm. throughout Greater Worcester. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had um, two or three uh, sort of ice cream stores and, and restaurants. Apparently, if you, when you're uh, on Main Street, the first house to the right of the high school, um, cute little um, house with um, arches. Um, that was the first uh, Sibley Farms dairy cottage ah. where you could buy ice cream back <laughs> in the day. And uh, uh, Anyway, it was quite an operation, but it really ended with uh, John Sibley's death in the early 60s. And before he died, uh, he gave to Mass Audubon what is now um, the sort of core of Burncote Pond Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, the high the town bought some of the land for the high school and, uh, and the rest of it was, was sold. Um, but fortunately, a fair bit of the farm has remained intact, and that's about 250 acres today that is part of, uh, I'm sorry, about 224 acres today that's part of what we're trying to save. So we're about to come up along the top edge of the field, and where we are right now, if you can see on this small map, is right about there in that northwestern corner of the upper field. And we will sort of pass through a corner of it and then along the edge of it. And you'll see these fields haven't been touched in probably six years since the developer bought it from, from Wendy Warner. And uh, they're grown up to um, a healthy stand of goldenrod and, and other, uh, other vegetation. Um, question for all of us is sort of how, if we are successful in acquiring this property, what to do with these fields. It'd be a shame to let them revert to woods. Um, we don't have enough fields. Uh, they're wonderful wildlife habitat. Whether they're maintained sort of like this or whether we try to return them um, back to hay, uh, which uh, other types of wildlife like bobolinks love, um, are things to be discussed <coughs> and, and decisions to be made. Does Audubon manage a 
farm? Do they have farm implements that they could transfer here and, and uh, harvest? Uh, yep, uh, we do, sort of depending upon it, well, that brings up another question, Dick, which is sort of who would own and, and how would this land be managed? Um, one option is that the town could own it. Another option is that some combination of the nonprofits involved, Mass Audubon, Greater Worcester Land Trust, could own it and manage it. It's a question of uh, several things. Who can afford to manage it? Um, <coughs> who's got the resources, the expertise, etc.? cetera? Um, and then uh, sort of what uses the property should be put to. Um, on Audubon Sanctuary land, we allow some uses and not others. Greater Worcester Land Trust allows for sort of a greater uh, diversity of, of human use. They allow hunting, for instance, and, oh. and, uh, and uh, dogs and, and <laughs> so forth. So um, <coughs> all those are things that um, we're frankly talking about now. And, and one of the reasons for walks like this is so that people can learn about the property and, and offer their own input. We had one public hearing back in August. We'll have another one probably early November or, or late October. And we're continuing to talk to people throughout about sort of what it is that they'd like and, and what we think you know really is, is practical here. Right. Now does that get to, oh, and so in terms of uh, managing the fields, uh, Mass Audubon has some equipment uh, and, uh, and staff. Uh, it's also something that we might lease to a farmer or engage a farmer mm -hmm. to cut for us without mm -hmm. uh, uh, managing it for production hay. So right. lots of questions along those lines. Great. But one of the things that really makes this property so wonderful, we are just emerging from some upland woods. We're about to go into an old field. Uh, we'll uh, go down on the north slope of this drumlin and uh, walk through more woods, cross wetlands uh, near the pond, and emerge into active hay fields. Just a wonderful diversity of habitat uh, that produces a, a terrific diversity of wildlife mm -hmm. here, as well as just being fun to walk through. Now, is this still Warner? Here. Yes, yep, still on the beyond, wall. Property. Beyond the wall yep. is Warner. Yep, okay. yep, yep. This gives you a sense of how big, yeah. because the Warner oh. property is 128 oh. eight acres out of the 350, mm -hmm. so roughly okay. 40. Yeah. Well, that's a little more than a church. Okay. Oh, really? Anyone know what this is? Here. Uh, is it either elderberry or hawkweed? It's, it's uh, called baneberry, and, but it has a more common name, uh, which you'll probably understand once I tell it to you, of doll's eyes. And uh, it's, um, you'll see it uh, in fruit this time of year, and uh, once you see it and hear the name, you, uh, you never forget it. I have a, a friend who we were walking through some wood, dry woods uh, late um, in the summer, and, and these were everywhere. And he said, you get the feeling we're being walked? <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, we're at the back of the field. The crest of the hill is a little bit in front of us, and it's so cloudy today you couldn't see it otherwise. But were we on the other side of this field, at that hedgerow that you can see in the distance, you'd have a wonderful view looking south, because we're close to the top of a drumlin. It probably I don't know, drops 150 feet on the other side. And so you really got a dramatic view to the south and just the rolling hills of uh, the southern part of Spencer and, and beyond. So this is pretty much due south? Yes. This way. Yep. Yep. Did you say drumlin? A drumlin? Yeah. A drumlin is a hill. It, it's a, um, someone here may know more about them than I do, but it's basically a, um, a glacial feature um, that um, the glacier shaped certain hills uh, as drumlins, and they tend to be uh, somewhat elongated north and south and somewhat compressed east-west. And that's, ex if you look on uh, a topographic map, this looks like a, a classic drumlin. And uh, in this case, the, the fields are on the southern exposure. Uh, they are terrific soils, and they get great sun, and they are extremely productive hay fields as a result. Maybe the hay could pay for the maintenance. Well, it's called a red eft, and it is the terrestrial stage of, I want to say the red back salamander, but here's where my colleagues at Mass Audubon will crucify me because I'm sure I'll get it wrong. And you tend to see them uh, this time of year um, after a rain. 
conditions just like this. Uh, sometimes uh, you almost have to watch with every step. They're easy to miss. Just to show everyone where we are, uh, we are right there. Here's this pond here. And one of the things that really makes this property uh, so valuable from a conservation perspective is that uh, through the middle part of the property, we have a series of wetlands. We have this large beaver pond. Uh, it did have water in it in 2009. Uh, the dam came out, and, and that's now open marsh. But the beavers will return at some point. Um, but that flows through a wetlands behind me down into this pond, into another beaver pond, and eventually down into Burncoat Pond. So all of this serves as watershed for Burncoat Pond, for Cedar Meadow Pond, helping to protect the water quality of that area, as well as providing uh, a, a series of uh, diverse wetlands for a wonderful variety of wildlife. Um, and uh, so we have beaver, we have otter, um, and a number of waterfowl, herons, and others that, uh, that live in here that rely on this series of wetlands. I think in the development proposal, this hillside right here was going to be hollowed out into one of the detention basins that would have been necessary uh, uh, to control the stormwater from the development. And could be again, unless help, uh, we can be successful. So watch your step. We're going to, a little bit of wetland crossing here, a little more up ahead. And, uh, our top. But this is uh, this is a trail maintained by the snowbirds. This is okay. the snowmobile trail yeah, as it passes across the property. It goes down. If you look on your the map you have with you, yep, we are. Uh, you can just barely make out a bridge right across this wetlands, uh, just north of the pond, and that's where we are. Mm -hmm. We're in the woods just to the west of it, but if you went down that road, you'd cross the bridge and off the Sibley property onto the property um, owned by the Spencer Country Inn and the Eckleberries. Oh, okay. Uh, and so from here on uh, until we get to the hayfield, we'll be on the trail that the snowbird, snowbirds uh, maintain, maintain and, and, and use they through do. the winter. I mean, I worked on the rail trail with them, and they were out there all the time. With oh, the this is Dick's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. They, yeah. they, do, they yeah. do great work. Yeah. They do great work. We're right down at the southeastern corner of this large hay field right here, and uh, just over the brow of the hill right there is Route 9. And these hay fields have been actively mown for years. Um, uh, Jeff DeRosier and before him his, his dad, uh, probably going back over 30 years, have, have hayed these fields. Unfortunately, they've only had it on a sort of year-to-year -year basis or even less because um, it's, it's only been because the land has been in limbo either with the developer or with the bank. You know, as many of you know, it's gone back and forth several times over the last 20 years. So they haven't really been able to invest in these fields in terms of liming and fertilizing and if we can secure them long term <laughs> then it allows them and um, in the future other farmers that we'd like to have uh, manage these fields uh, the long-term time horizon that it takes to really uh, take care of these fields well we're hoping that here with these actively used hay fields that the state program that buys development rights on farmland will be a partner with us we hope they will be another piece of the puzzle and they would buy the development rights on these fields, ensuring that you know another piece of the financial puzzle. Uh, and in return, there's a restriction that ensures that this land will always be available for commercial agriculture. It can never be developed. All right, uh, we just go up along the edge of that. explained before, uh, we have an option. We're trying to assemble a conservation partnership. Uh, we're hopeful that we can figure out a way for all the pieces to fit together. 
Uh, there's no way that we can afford this uh, property without uh, a commitment by the town in terms of, of um, a town appropriation at a special town meeting that will probably be held in December, as well as by um, private fundraising by the three nonprofits. Uh, those of you who are Spencer residents, uh, if you like the idea of preserving this land, please let your town leaders know, the selectmen, the conservation commission, uh, etc. Uh, there will be a public hearing, as I say, probably uh, either the last week of October or early November to gather more public input on this. And then there will be a, uh, a town meeting in December. So please come, speak, uh, let your friends know about this, and, uh, and help us save this land.